my presentation here today is around the issue of cyber security. And I'm, I'm looking at it from the particular angle of how people need to be involved with cyber security, more particularly the way in which cyber security is presented or presents itself to cyber security, the opportunities we consequently have to interact with it. So, we take a lot of reading around the issue, if we look at surveys, if we look at various evidence over the years, to find that there's been this growing realisation within the, the domain more widely that, okay, a lot of what we need to be concerned about in terms of providing cyber security, IT security, etc., is around the technology, but that that really isn't going to work effectively unless we also address some of the people aspects. And so, okay, if you look at survey evidence, you can find various incidents of reported breaches, where again, often a lot of the time there's technology involved, but there is also a people angle to it. So people have not understood what they're supposed to be doing, people have failed to configure things correctly, and in some cases, of course, people have deliberately gone out of their way to try and breach security. What I'm particularly thinking about here is the scenarios where we as individuals are trying to use security, but what's provided for us is often frustrating our ability to do so. So a lot of incidents get tracked back to users accidentally and deliberately, but it doesn't always mean that it's their fault. In many of the cases, if the technology was fitter for purpose, and in some cases if organisations in which these people are using the technology or trying to follow other security procedures, has done something more around awareness raising, around education, around providing it in a more appropriate manner, then there would have been a better opportunity for people to actually play their part appropriately. Okay, there's often, and you might recognize this from your own interactions with security on your, your PC, on mobile devices, etc., a mismatch between what we want, what we expect from security, what we'd like it to do for us, and what we actually get in terms of the way that it's realized and the way that it's made available to us. And so that often can be a cause of frustration in terms of, okay, I really want to be able to, to, to regard myself as a secure user, I want to have protection on my, let's say, mobile device, but the way in which it's been made available to me actually makes it really inconvenient when I come down to wanting to use the device for, for routine activity. And so it can often be the case that, well, actually, if it, if it comes down to me being inconvenient every time I want to do something versus me being more protected, I'll actually take the thing that makes it more convenient. In some cases, users don't have that choice. The devices are configured for them so they can't remove the protection. But we've got evidence to suggest that in many cases, if the choice is there, people will compromise security for the sake of convenience. So, in terms of what we get and where we get it from, so in some cases, this is people who we would expect to be providing the security or making it available to us, prescribing the sort of things that are expected from us, making the facilities available. So, for example, websites. A good example here is when we're required to register on websites to have a user account for whatever reason and to create some authentication credentials. And many sites will require us to do it. Far fewer of them will do it in a way that actually guides us sensibly about what we're required to do and why. So we just make some sort of insistence that no, it needs to be, let's say, a password of at least as many characters and at least this type of composition. But make no attempt to educate the user as to why that's relevant. And also employers, in the context of we have a base of staff that we are expecting to comply with that say, security policy, if one exists, but then not doing, if you like, the square in the circle, completing the process in terms of providing awareness raising, providing guidance to people on how they're meant to fulfill those expectations and, in many cases, obligations that are placed upon them. And also, as I say, from the technologies themselves that often are used as the enabling mechanism to be secure, but in some cases, you look at how the technology is presented by the way it's been designed and developed and implemented on a system and what then confronts users on a regular basis, and there's often some gap between how it would be nice for it to work and how it actually does. So I say, this can very much end up affecting how security gets perceived by the user community. And so I'm very much thinking around the, the end users who often can feel the beneficiaries or the victims of security, depending upon the perception that they're taking at the time. And their perception will often depend upon whether they're actively wanting something from security at that point, so expecting it to be there as their safety net to protect them, or whether their priority at that point is, is to be doing something else. So we can end up with different perceptions 
from people as a result, and their views of the same individual can sometimes change depending on the context. But one possible perception is security is our friend, and that's ideally, of course, from a security professional's perspective, is how we'd like it to be. It always ought to be perceived as our friend because it's there for good reason. So it's a guardian angel, it's something that is sitting there making sure that the user is protected in whatever context they're trying to operate. It's not threat, it safeguards our data. It, it's actively safeguarding the system and the things that we value against whatever inadvertent and undesirable consequence could otherwise occur. It provides reassurance to us as users because we know that, okay, security is there, we've got a level of protection, so I'm therefore feeling better about doing, let's say, online shopping, about doing my general activities when I'm browsing the internet, the web. Um, I feel I can do that quite simply because I've got internet security safeguards sitting in the background. And as a consequence, it's enabling the activities that we're actually wanting to do. Very few people, I would argue, are trying to use the technology just to experience its security features. They're trying to do something else. Now, that's desirable. It's our friend. But in many contexts, people will perceive it to be, well, maybe saying it's our enemy is, is taking it a little bit too strongly, but in many cases, it's a nuisance, it's a barrier, it's an impediment to what we're trying to do, because fundamentally, it can get in the way. If you're trying to get a productive task done, then having to have some sort of enforced security interaction between you and the thing that you're wanting to do is not the most welcome context. It makes things take longer. So you've got checks and balances you need to follow, procedures you need to go through, and again, that wasn't the ultimate goal that you were trying to achieve. You've got a particular productive task, something that you want to do as, a, as an individual for major purposes, and nonetheless, security is there requiring extra attention from you. It says no. It can actively prevent us from doing the very thing that we're trying to do. So you get a warning, for example, in a web browser, and it's presented in such a way that it makes you afraid to complete the action that you were in the process of doing. So, well, okay, maybe I actually better stop doing that, and I did want to do it, but I'm now too concerned, and security is preventing me from fulfilling the thing I wanted. And it consequently makes us worry. We get these warnings coming up, and I'll have some examples as we go. Things appear, but sometimes we might not understand what they mean. It uses sort of end users terminology which is too technical, could be completely alien, seems to make sense to the security software that it is telling us something and it's asking us sometimes to make a decision that we want to do this, that or the other. But if we don't understand the decision that we're, we're taking, then at the least we could be concerned about it or think, well, maybe this is no place for me to be interacting in the first place. And therefore, it can be the exact opposite of, of what we'd like it to be. We want it to be that safeguard, that safety net that enables people to be confident, but it could end up completely blocking the sort of activity that people want to do. So in terms of how I would argue it ought to be approached, particularly if we think about it from an organisational perspective, in terms of providing the foundations for our staff to be able to operate with confidence and in terms of compliance with what the organisation wants, that's one of the fundamentals is for an organisation to establish some sort of policy around the So what are the expectations? What are the boundaries within which somebody is supposed to be operating? So, in an organizational context, that, that can be a fundamental foundation there. On top of that, and this you can also think about in the wider context of end users operating on the internet, etc., there needs to be a level of awareness. So, for example, what are the threats that we might be exposed to? What are the, the relevant controls, safeguards, countermeasures that we should be using to protect against them? And are we, in terms of our systems, actually running those sectors? So various types of awareness that could be relevant. And on top of that, particularly given that we're dealing with, in many cases, technical control, that this can also apply to procedures that we expect users to be following, there needs to be a level of usability. And that can encompass issues of understandability, of tolerability, of the overhead that things impose. But things need to be viable, they need to be workable if we're going to accept these as useful. And to varying degrees, these things tend to be addressed. But if we look firstly at the issue of policy, and what I've got here are some results from the last few years' work of the UK's Information Security Breaches Survey, which has been, well, at least for that period of time, I think, consistently conducted by PricewaterhouseCoopers, 
currently this year is one published by under the banner of Biz, the Department of Business and Innovation Skills. It has been up until 2012, it was a biennial survey, now it's going to be released annually, so we've got a sort of a annual tracking there. And what we can see here, this is the usage of security policies within different sizes of organizations. So the, the lighter blue and the one denoted with the, the L there, that's large organizations, and the S and the darker blue is small organizations. And what we can see over time, it seems that there's been significant adoption of security policies and use within large organisations that now, according to the current survey, 99% of large UK respondent <coughs> organisations claim that they have a security policy. The situation for smaller organisations seems somewhat less positive. In fact, the, the trend is downwards over the last few iterations of the survey, and there's a tangible gap in terms of the proportion of organisations that say they have one. Now, does this mean that staff within Smaller organisations have no security issues to worry about, or fewer, or half uh, of the security issues to worry about? No, of course not. They use very much many of the similar systems, similar data, just on a different scale. But they can still be the recipients of attacks, they can still be the targets of incidents, and they can still certainly have many styles of security breach that can occur. But in those contexts, staff, right from the outset, are perhaps less well served in terms of having security foundations being laid forward. Looking again at the same <coughs> survey series, looking at what the same respondents were talking about in terms of their awareness raising efforts, one notable thing was that additional provision of staff training was the most common response that the organisation reported <coughs> doing once a breach had occurred, once an incident had occurred. So quite clearly, there was to see once something bad had happened, it was down to a lack of staff training that they perceived that it had been able to occur. So this was a a response to try and rectify the situation for the future. So first, have a potential question there is, if more attention had been paid to user awareness in the first instance, could a breach or an incident have been avoided? If we look particularly, I'll just use the example of mobile device security, so I'll pick up the theme later. Looking at that theme, 66% of the organisations have got some sort of policy that they issued on mobile computing, but only 23% had done anything or reported doing anything to train their staff in relation to the threats that they might face on those devices. So many of them actually still don't have a policy, and very few of them have done anything actively to make staff aware and say, you've got a mobile device now, these are the sorts of things you might need to be concerned about in terms of protecting it or the attacks that you might face electronically through it. One thing that was also notable in terms of where efforts had been made to raise awareness, did they make a difference? Let's just think about the security policy in the case where they had them. Where they had a security policy that was um, poorly understood, 93% of companies with poorly understood policies had had breaches. As opposed to only 47% of them having breaches where they felt the policy was well understood. So where they made the efforts to promote the policy, their, their level of breaches actually decreased. Okay, so not to reduce it to zero, we thought you can't to do that, but there's a tangible reported level of reduction. Let me think now, okay, that's the organisational context, policy, awareness and efforts that ought to be made. Let's now think more generally about the end user experience, and this could be within the workplace, this could be in their private lives, their domestic or personal use of technologies, the sorts of scenarios in which people are likely to encounter security. And just one example context, some examples from Windows 8 the latest version of the Windows operating system. So here we have the various security related options from the, the control panel. So we've got things like network firewall, Windows update, virus protection, spyware protection, etc, etc. There are things that ideally I guess you want to configure to have enabled to protect you. And in many cases the defaults are fine and users as long as they don't fiddle with them um, will be protected. But this is software facing everyday users. How many users are going to be fully familiar with what all this is talking about in the first place? Okay. The, the level of help and support that's there if you go looking for it, to actually understand some of the terminology, is not as readily available as the things that you're meant to be considering. And then if you look under the surface for a lot of these, let's say you've got things like Windows Smart Screen, which provides the phishing filter, so there's various options that you might want to con uh, configure within your browser relating to that and what the system is supposed to do in the event that it's you visit a site that could be suspected of being a, a 
exceptions like a fishing site. We've got user account control, which limits what programs can do without your specific permission if they're trying to make changes within the system. So um, executing on them, exercising additional privileges, etc. And you might, if you're a Windows user, recognize the scenario where some the, the screen dims and then you have a, a dialogue come up saying, such and such a program wants to do such and such a thing, are you willing to allow it to do so? And you have to make a security related decision in that context. Again, many users won't feel suitably equipped to know what they're actually answering. And other users who aren't suitably equipped to answer the question might still be quite irritated that this is now interrupting their normal activity. There's yet more. There's things around the Windows firewall. And again, many people won't necessarily feel the need to go looking, but if, if people are told that security is an issue for them, they might be tempted to go looking and seeing what the settings are. And so there's those. And then there's Windows Defender for the malware protection. So just within, if you like, the standard desktop operating system, which millions of people use, there's quite a lot of security there that is configurable, could end up being configured incorrectly, and could end up constantly compromising the protection of the millions of people it's meant to be protecting. <coughs> and if we think of another context, we're just picking on iOS mobile devices here, just a selection, and this is uh, taken from my own um, iOS device, if you look at the privacy controls, um, so just a subset again of some of the available functionality, you've got various things on which your privacy could potentially be affected by what your device is divulging outside or allowing other apps to gain access to on your device. So various things that you consider location settings, your contact list, your calendar, your reminders, your photos, Bluetooth, your microphone, etc. And then on each of these, there's some level of further configuration, so you can make a decision as to whether here, for example, you want to allow Twitter to access your photos. Okay, what are the implications of that? In terms of the implications, there's very little information here to guide you on whether you want to have that enabled or not. And so this is something where, again, the user, by default, might not feel particularly well equipped to make a decision, or at least not an informed one. And this is, this is, again, just the sort of device everybody could be carrying around these days in their pocket. Quite a number of routes by which if you've not got it set up properly, your personal content could find its way shared between apps, out into the cloud, and between devices. So one of the things we've done recently here at Plymouth University is to conduct, or we've begun to conduct, a survey of end users, looking at their claims claims, I should say, security practices. So we've not verified whether people are telling us the truth, but this is at least what people believe they're doing. And so thus far we've got data from September and October of this year, but it is an ongoing activity. And we've looked at several practices which we consider to be baseline things that, that everyday end users now are likely to be encountering. And so what I'm going to present to you on the next few slides of the pie chart is based on 290 respondents that we've analysed to date. So one of the things we thought was relevant to ask for that is their practices in terms of installing updates and patches on their system. So again, you probably recognize from your own experiences that many of your devices, and more particularly your software, will invite you to install updates, and many of those claim to be critical security updates. And this could be Windows, could be Mac OS, could be your mobile devices. And uh, what do people do in response to those solicitations from the software? Well, we found that only 25% of the people we surveyed thus far do the thing that I guess is the right answer from a certain point of view, which is to immediately install the patch. And the reason that it's useful to do that, particularly if it's a security related update, is that unpatched systems are a great source of exploitation. So malware, hackers, a lot of this is going after systems that, that could have been rectified but haven't been and so vulnerability remains apparent. Now, there are obviously some counter arguments to why you might not want to immediately jump in and install an update because sometimes the updates themselves can introduce incompatibilities and, and more problems than you expected. Um, but nonetheless, relatively few people doing in a sense the right thing. Some people generally ignoring them, okay, these people are making a value judgment on whether it's in turn the critical update, and these people perhaps are leaving themselves vulnerable to a, an inappropriate period of time. Different of security. One that even more people will be familiar with is the thing about user authentication. We have to do this 
multiple times a day, I would suggest, on various types of devices and systems. So one of the things that we asked our respondents was how many password protected devices, services, do you have? So not how many different passwords, but how many different password protected things. And perhaps unsurprisingly, over a third of them are reporting they've got 16 or more things that require some sort of password based authentication. And relatively few have got a small number. Okay? Now this I think is, is likely to be common, but this is a, a show of hands in the room. How many people would fall into the category of 16 plus? Okay, so this, this is not, in fact this pattern is very typical because these people have, or this, the proportion of people here is much less than the proportion in the room. Okay, so what do people do with their passwords? We all have them. Um, how many people follow again what the textbook practice might be of having a different password on every system? So okay, let's do a show of hands in the room for that. A couple of people equally showing their hands and most people resolutely keep them down. Um, how many people have uh, the same password on every system? Probably you should say that. <laughs> <laughs> you possibly shouldn't, but this isn't a social engineering exercise. Um, you are on film. Uh, and how many people choose from a set? Okay, so the, okay, the majority yeah. in the room is the same as the majority in our server. And that, the reason for that is because it makes it more manageable for people. Okay, we sort of get told that you should have different passwords, but it's different, difficult to have a different one on every system that we're using in terms of memorability and manageability of it. Unless, of course, we do something else that we're told not to do, which is write them down. Um, now, there are ways around. Of course, you could write down reminders, you could write down an encoded version of a password that would be meaningful to you, but not for somebody else or they would discover it. But that very often is too much effort for, for lay users, or too much thinking for them to go through. And they can just write down the standard thing, or just go the and have the same on everything. So the passwords have been with us for some time. So how has the technology actually advanced for us? Well, one advancement, perhaps, is this sort of thing, where the system offers now to remember your password. So you don't have that requirement to enter it every time, and you don't have to worry about remembering yourself. So as I say, they're automating the chance to actually forget what the password is. Um, and also, automating the potential for the system to be vulnerable now. If somebody else comes along and your system is, for example, remains logged in, somebody can now come to the web browser concern and go to some of your sensitive sites and services without having to log in themselves. The other, I suppose, bit of progress that we've seen in more recent years is many systems on the web and on uh, operating systems themselves will give you some rating about the, the security level of your password. How good is it? Okay, so it's password strength meters like this one, which I think in this case was from Google. Um, so this is also making arguably the guidance that makes them harder to remember, because if you're going to store good or excellent in terms of a password here, then you're having to have something that's long, multiple character types, etc., which then puts you in that realm of a password that's tricky to keep in mind. So look, you know, these things have their place, but the underlying technique of passwords still isn't that friendly. Again, from our survey, asking people about their password practices, how, how well do they claim that they, they choose them and use them, we asked them in this particular question to consider their most important Council device, the most important thing on which they have a password. So it was that password at least eight characters long. And most people it was, but council support, no, it, it wasn't. And that, that's not to say eight characters is, is a utopian situation here. That's just probably the best case you would find in terms of websites asking you to choose a password. You won't find many websites like Google, Amazon, eBay, etc., that would ask you for anything more than eight as the baseline minimum. Use that here as the baseline. Does it have alphabetic and numeric characters? Most people do. Um, does it have other characters, punctuation symbols, for example, to further enrich the character space against a potential brute force attack? Yeah, fewer people there, which of course is a little bit more difficult to remember than the punctuation symbols if you throw them in there. And in some cases, of course, the password systems are a bit picky over whether they'll let you use certain punctuation symbols. So the implementation sometimes doesn't make it better. Well, you, did you use a word you'd find in the dictionary? So most people not, but there's still a tangible proportion that do. So those are immediately vulnerable to automated password auditing or cracking tools, depending on how we view them. 
Is it based on personal information? Again, a minority sport there, but still more people than we would hope uh, these days, given that all of this is sort of the standard advice about what to do and what not to do. Avoiding personal information, somebody who knows you could know already, or somebody who socially engineers you a little bit could acquire. And then in terms of, so this is all around selection. What about once they've got the password and they're using it in practice? How many people have changed it? Well, not that many. Um, and of course, the, the textbook advice would suggest it will change every month or something like this. Um, how many people change it at all regularly? Not many. Um, how many people have shared it with others? Well, this seems to be the best understood bit of advice. People generally within our respondent group did understand that the password is meant to be a secret. Okay, and not share with other people. And how many people have had problems remembering it themselves? Well, a few. And again, that suggests a level of inconvenience around the mechanism. So it's not painting a wonderful picture, given that, as I said, passwords have been with us for many, many years, and all of this is sort of standard advice that we ought to be familiar with. The fact is, the mechanism just isn't that easy to use. But if we provide guidance, does it make a difference? Because one thing you'll notice if you go and have a look at some of these websites that I mentioned, is that many of them don't provide guidance in a meaningful way. Some will now provide password meters, and they'll tell you if it's good or bad. In some cases, they won't explain why it's good or bad. You just have to fiddle around typing stuff until the bar goes green, or something like this. So we've done another little study, looking at uh, what difference providing password guidance actually makes. And so basically we, we took those first five criteria from that previous paper around password correction. What did they say characters? Did it have alphanumeric content? Were there any other characters in it? Was it not a dictionary word? And was it not based on discernible personal information? And scored user practices out of five based on what they actually ended up choosing. And we did this in the context of a practical study where users were asked to register for a an online site that was going to look at web usability. They weren't told that this was a study of anything to do with what password they were choosing. Selecting a password was just something they had to do as part of the registration process. So we then looked at how they perform. Okay, so there was a version of the site, and if you can see the video, because this is in German, because I suppose this is where our colleagues intended. Um, there was a version without guidance, and there was a version with guidance and with a password meter provided. Okay? So two versions of the same site didn't make a difference in terms of what the users ended up choosing. Well, actually, it did. So for the unguided users, taking our sort of non-weighted but just out of five based on uh, those previous criteria score, the average for non-guided users was 1.9 as opposed to 3.7 out of five for those users that received guidance as part of the process. So, and you can see there the breakdown in terms of guided and unguided, not huge samples of users but what they did well and what they didn't do. And we said, okay, for example, use of other characters, punctuation <coughs> symbols, etc. It wasn't perfect, even when they had guidance. But it was ten times better than those people who didn't get guidance. Okay? And so this is perhaps a lesson for website providers and organizations asking users to choose passwords. If you just tell them the basics of what you ought to do and perhaps why you ought to do it and what difference it makes, it does tend to change the outcome in terms of what they choose. So how about in different contexts? So we've learned to some degree the lessons around password authentication on our desktop devices, our, our normal systems, if you like, but how much of that has transferred to our use of these newfangled mobile devices that we all like to carry around? And we asked this again within the, the current survey. So what methods do people use? Well, many, most people, if they use anything, they use a pin. And now in some cases, people are able to use multiple of the methods, so these don't necessarily add up to 100. Um, okay, relatively few people use nothing. Um, that, that's good, but still, if you think about you know, almost a fifth of people, what they're likely to have on those devices now, in terms of sensitive information, you know, photos, all those reminders, all of that sort of stuff, their email, very often also overlapping into something that their employer has allowed them access to, so accessing company email via a personal mobile device is not unusual in a BYOD context. The most common method then is the, the PIN. If you can look at what's happening on the desktop system, it wouldn't be a PIN that's providing the authentication for all of these bits of data and services. It would almost certainly be a password or something better. So now we've got a device that's actually allowing access to pretty much the same stuff, 
a more vulnerable device that can be lost or stolen far more easily, protected by a tangibly weaker method of authentication. Why? Because, of course, it's an easier mechanism for people to use on that sort of device than a password. If you try typing in a, a long, multiple character type password on an iPhone or an Android uh, smartphone, it's a bit of a nuisance because you have to keep swapping between different virtual keyboards, etc. So one of the things that we're increasingly seeing on mobile devices, and this is happening more on mobile devices routinely than, than on other uh, paradigms of devices, is other authentication alternatives. So on Android devices, you've got pattern lock, pattern unlock, where you have to connect the dots basically in a secret sequence, and that's what you use to unlock your device rather than having to remember a PIN or a password. And perhaps on a touch screen sort of device, that's a reasonably acceptable method to use. Android also offers facial recognition, so you hold the phone up, it's got a front-facing camera, you hold the phone up, it sees your face, which it's been trained to recognize, and it unlocks. And on the latest um, Apple iPhone, the 5S, there's now their first implementation of what they call the touch screen. <coughs> so a fingerprint sensor built into the home button on the device, so the, the sort of button you normally press to turn the device on, now by pressing your finger on that surface, um, uh, you are authenticated by means of that having been trained to recognize you. Yeah. Now, all of these are potentially more usable, more acceptable in that context than a PIN or a password. But notably, notably all of them, from the, the vendor's perspective, are promoted as being less secure than a PIN, less secure than a password. So, on iOS, with the Touch ID, if, you get the, if the Touch ID doesn't work, it doesn't recognize you, it reverts to pin-based or password-based authentication, the passcode unlock, as the master technique. Similarly, on these. Okay? And particularly with these two, with, um, with the pattern unlock, there's been documented ways that that actually sometimes quite vulnerable. I mean, even if somebody's holding a phone up in front of you, you can't see the screen, you can often see the pattern that they're making, by the way, their arm moves. And sometimes if you hold the screen, in the light, you can actually see the smear marks of where they've been doing the pattern. Facial unlock, is the first release here was shown to be vulnerable to just holding up a photo of the legitimate user, so the phone would unlock the stack of picture. More recently, um, in Android Jelly Bean and onwards, liveness detection has been introduced, so you have to blink to, to show that you're actually the person live there. But that has also been shown to be able to be fooled by having a picture of the legitimate user with eye holes cut and you click behind that. <laughs> or indeed having an animated image where you've got a picture with eyes open and then you, you mask it out and made, it, made a picture with eyes closed and then you alternate between them. Touch ID, okay, Chaos Computer Club in Germany within a couple of days of the iPhone 5S coming out showed that it was breakable. But breakable with a downside more effort, I would argue, than you could actually observe somebody entering their PIN. Okay, so this one, I think, sets the bar a bit higher and is a more reliable technology than, than those two. But still, Apple isn't promoting it as a higher level of security. It's promoting it as a means of convenience. Okay, another, another aspect here. In terms of the decisions that people have to make, I'm sticking with passwords just for this one again. Do people appreciate the decisions that they're being asked to make? So here we have another of those things about saving your password. This time, on the latest version of um, iOS 10, uh, Maverick, you can save your password to your iCloud keychain, which means it's automatically shared between all of your iCloud enabled devices. So you can save it on your Mac, and your iPad, your iPhone, in this, that particular case, will all have that password accessible to you. That makes it very convenient for the user, but to what degree is that now making security weaker if, for example, your Mac might be protected with a nice password on it, if your iPhone is going around unprotected and now somebody can visit that the same site and find completely unimpeded access through that device. And there is no guidance, there's no, no help to say what's the implications of saying that, that, or that. And for many people, we'll click the not now because it, it defers a decision and they're not really guided in the implications Making. And that's the same for many other types of security dialogue you can come across. Okay? You're being asked to make a decision, you don't really know what the implications of each option are. So this links into the point of needing to strike the balance. You need to be able to explain for those you don't understand without getting too much in the way for those who actually appreciate the implications already and don't need to be told every time. 
Okay, so one size doesn't fit all. You don't want to overwhelm the user with too much information or too much help, etc. But they should have control in scenarios where they want it. So if they want support, they should be able to get it. If they need to be able to do something, they should be able to do that. So when we then look at examples of this, so it's a little bit easy to find yourself, well, I find myself feeling a little bit like gold drops. Well, no, that one's too, too, too busy, that one's too... That one's too hot, that one's too cold, that one's too hard, that one's too soft, etc. So examples, two views of a similar or same type of antivirus product, this one on the Mac. Um, the Pegos virus barrier, well, okay, this interface has got quite a lot on it, but is it too much? Uh, so you've got this big thing that's telling you how much it's scanned, perhaps that's the key information. You've got little dials over here, little camera there, little graph there, all these other options, green lights, red lights, etc. How much does the user actually need to know in terms of their systems being scanned and whether anything has been found? Okay, so this interface is mixing together the actual scanning and the real-time monitoring, etc. Et for some users, it's perfectly fine. They, they like it. It, it. It's good. But for the, the lay user uh, who doesn't know anything about what's going on, maybe that's too much. Alternative version, their Internet Security 2013 product, taken all that away. Now, do a scan, and it will just tell you the percentage completed. Now, you've got no dashboard information for the general real-time monitoring. You can't tell the degree of network traffic coming in that you've not got that richness of information. So for the law, technically aware user who wanted that and valued that other information, now it's all gone. Okay, so neither of the scenarios are perfect for all comers. And this, I think, is the problem we face with quite a lot of the ways that security is implemented. And what we ideally like is to have the option to choose how much of it gets exposed based upon what we understand and how we might progress in our understanding over time. Another thing is how well are our lessons being learned. Okay, so we've learned certain things in some context. I mentioned about authentication with passwords. We can do some of this on desktop devices but not mobile. But what about our depth of understanding, the way we use it, and whether we transfer the knowledge to different contexts? Let's look again, keeping with that theme of antivirus software, and just talk to interface examples. In our survey, 95% of people say they have antivirus on their laptop, on their desktop, their traditional computing device. And only 14% of, it, of them rather, have it on their phone, on their smartphone. In many cases, because they just don't appreciate that there's any threat to be concerned about in that scenario. Okay, I'll come back to that. Um, are they using the latest signature updates? Signatures being the things that enable the antivirus product and give them one route to seeing whether the system is infected with the latest malware by matching the bytecode that's in memory with a bit of bytecode of known malware strain. Two thirds of people say yes, they are using those signatures. Now that might be optimistic thinking in actual fact. Our earlier studies have shown that in many cases where people think they are, they're actually not if you go and look at their systems. But let's take a chat. We two thirds think they are. What about the rest? 3% actually say no. 10% um, don't know what signatures are. Okay, so the fact that their antivirus product is telling them probably somewhere on the line that their signatures are out of date or their signatures need updating, they don't know what that, the significance of that is. And almost a quarter don't know whether their signatures are up to date. So probably some of them are, probably some of them aren't. But this proportion of people we need to be a little bit worried about in terms of their basic understanding of what that protection is doing for them and how it ought to be working. Going back to our mobile users, we specifically then honed in on Android users amongst the results. The reason being that Android devices are now significantly vulnerable to malware. Okay, there has been a casual increase over the last couple of years in the number of malware strains appearing on Android into the thousands per month on average, so I think about 6,000 per month was the average for last year, from cat birthday now. That pales into insignificance compared to Windows malware still, but it's, it's a lot more than there was in the past. And 98% of malware, maybe 99% of malware from mobile devices, targets the Android platform. So if you're an Android user, really, having an antivirus product running on your device might now be a good idea. But among other respondents, only 25% of the Android respondents had it. Okay. Many of them were likely to be unaware that they used it. So, final thoughts. So I think, particularly the designers and implementers of security, but also
also employers expecting staff to use particular technology. You need to remember that it has to be used and understood by somebody. And in many cases, what we're fundamentally asking is people to do something that they don't want to do. This isn't why they're trying to use the technology. Security behaviour doesn't come naturally in many cases. It won't be something that people have actively gone looking for, at least not in all of the contexts they possibly ought to. So we need to promote it, we need to raise awareness, we need to do something actively to get it on their agenda. And also technology can undermine its own effort. The way it's presented, the way it's implemented, often means that although it's there, it doesn't get used anywhere near as effectively or widely as it should be. But of course, technology alone doesn't save the day. People need to be supported. Again, there's various ways we can do it. We need to ensure that they're aware of the threats and that they have the safeguards available to them to deal with the threat and that they know how to use those safeguards. So there's educate awareness, training, education at various levels that if people don't already have it, they ought to be supported. If we think about it from the employer perspective, that actually is making a contribution then to, to safeguarding our environment too. But of course, it doesn't come for free. The return on investment of doing this, why, why should we spend money on trading as opposed to spending money on a firewall or antivirus internet security product? We, we know what the latter things are meant to deliver. What will trading and awareness give us? Well, it might not give us any improvement at all. We won't necessarily see it. But actually, if we look at surveys, where it hasn't occurred, where it was occurring retrospectively, so the, the response to an incident being the trained staff, something's already gone wrong. There's already been an adverse impact, and we're only seeing it after the whole Other than that, there's my contact details. Feel free to email me, follow me, and I'll also have a look at our research centre website to see more about what we do here at the university.